Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. We are a people that are called to worship God. Worship Him in light of His truth. Having received His Spirit, becoming individuals that behave, and I want to emphasize this, behave in a distinct manner. When we look at creation, we see early on that God made a distinction between darkness and light. And we, by the grace of God, by the work of Messiah, we have a new identity. We are children, sons, and daughters of the light. And we're called to reflect His light at all times. That's what being a disciple is about. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Exodus and chapter 35, the book of Exodus and chapter 35. Now, the passage that we're going to study today has significant instructions for us. We need to meditate upon these words, read them over and over, pray through them in order that that truth might be established in our heart because as one thinks in his heart, so is he. And we want to be people that, that embody biblical truth. We want to be people that have a testimony, a God-pleasing testimony. And I received an email not too long ago where someone rightly says, you speak about testifying, a witness, being a testifier, a witness for God so frequently. That's who we are as disciples. We bear witness, and that's exactly what Moses is going to emphasize in this passage. So Exodus 35, beginning with verse 1. Remember that Moses has gone up on Mount Sinai the second time, that he's been there 40 days and 40 nights, 40, referring to change. And we need to just stop right now and say, Oh God, I need a righteous change, a godly change in my life. I want my testimony to be radically different in light of your truth that manifests your will. If that's not your desire, close the Bible, turn off this, and do something else because you are a false believer. A true believer wants to bear witness to his Lord and Savior. He wants to do his will. He recognizes, she understands that she is an ambassador. She is a representative of his God, her God. And therefore, this is what Moses is teaching tonight in this passage. Verse 1, Vayakhel Moshe. Now, this word, kahal, in its basis form, if it's a noun, it is a congregation. If it's a verbal form, it means to congregate, to assemble. And that's what Moses is doing. He's assembling not just the children of Israel, but notice what the Word of God says. And Moses congregated, he assembled all, and notice this next word, Ada. It's Edat B'nai Israel because it's in the construct form, but what is this word? Now, many would say, if you look properly at a, a Strong's Concordance, a biblical dictionary, they will tell you that word, Eda, means congregation. And that's fine. But you need to understand the root of it. It literally comes from the word for witness, one that bears testimony. So now, 
having been redeemed and having been instructed in the commandments of God, the children of Israel have a new designation. They are called the congregation, the witnesses, those who bear testimony from the children of Israel. It's not all of those that came out. It's those that understand their call to submit to the, the instructions of God. All of verse 1. And Moses congregated all the testifiers, the witnesses of the children of Israel, and he said unto them, These are the words which the Lord commanded. And notice here, that there is a connection between the Hebrew word siva, commanded, he commanded the Lord, and the word for a witness. We bear witness when we embrace what the Lord commanded. That's the message. We are supposed to be submissive to the commandments of God, not for justification. Remember the paradigm. Redemption has already happened. The blood of the Lamb has taken place. It called the people out, brought them out. But now they're identifying what it means to be redeemed. We bear witness to the instructions of God, the word of God, the commandments of God. So once more, Moses congregated all the witnesses, the congregation of the children of Israel, and said unto them, these are the words which the Lord commanded. And what did he command about these words? To do them. Not to simply know them, but to do them. To express them. This is the connection between testifying witness. It's when you do what God has instructed. Now, here again. This is not speaking about the means of salvation, how we find justification, the forgiveness of sins, and be reconciled to God. This is teaching us how one who has been justified, who has been reconciled to God, how he expresses this relationship, this new relationship he has with God. He bears witness by embracing the instructions of God. And remember what we learn? It's only when we have, the, the perspective of God, that we can serve God, and it's the commandments of God that gives us his perspective. Verse 2. I think it's so interesting that the first thing that, that Moses reminds the children of Israel of is Shabbat, the Sabbath day. And why is that? Because the Shabbat teaches us something, that we are not on our own time schedule. We don't ask God, God, I'm busy. These are the things I'm doing. Will you please bless that? That's not faithfulness. That's not spirituality. That is rooted in sin. We need to realize, and Shabbat teaches us, that we are upon God's schedule. It is not, Shabbat does not teach us, well, rest is good, therefore rest one day a week. And what day is most convenient for you? Oh, it's Tuesday? Fine, choose Tuesday. doesn't say that. That's totally, biblical. Uh, uh, that's totally unbiblical. It says here, six days you shall do labor, but beyom shvi on the seventh day, beyom hashvi on the seventh day. And we learn that the term seven is related to purpose. It's related to that which is sanctified for God. So this seventh day, not one day of seven, but the seventh day is set apart. And notice what he says, lechem. it shall be for you. It's not for God. God needs nothing. It is for you, holy. And the same word holy relates to the purposes of God, sanctification, his will. So when we embrace the Sabbath, we are going to find God's holiness being manifested through us. And what do I mean by that? We're going to be committed to his purpose, his will. So six days you do labor, but on the seventh day it shall be for you holy, a sacred day of rest, Shabbat Shabbaton. And it means that you cease 
And it's this ceasing that brings about a response from God acknowledging the Sabbath day. Verse, verse 2, the second part, notice that it says, it is a Shabbat Shabbaton unto the Lord. Now it's for us, but we do it unto Him. What motivates me to apply Sabbath truth to my life? Not that I have to. I'm not under the law's judgment. That has been paid for. God does not punish now because of the Torah. We have received, when Messiah died upon that cross, he took the punishment of the law. Read the book of Galatians. He took the death and the curse. Why? So the promises of Abraham can come upon us, one that's based upon faith. And faith and the commandments are not in conflict. So many people see it this way, but it's false. Read what Paul says, a verse that I go to so frequently, Romans 8, verse 4. Those who walk not in the flesh, but who walk in the Spirit, notice what it says, we fulfill the righteousness of the law. So as believers being led by the Spirit, we fulfill the righteousness, we express the righteousness that is contained in the law. And that righteousness of the law, don't, don't ignore this, don't be unaware of this, the righteousness of the law is the character of Messiah. How do I know that? Well, remember what we read earlier on to evening from the book of Hebrews in chapter 4. It says Messiah was, was tested, tempted at all points just like us, but but without sin. And the fact that he never sinned, he never violated the law, he never did anything unrighteous. His behavior, his testimony expressed, it defined for us the righteousness of the law. And now through his spirit and only through his spirit, can we express in our behavior, our testimony, the righteousness of the law? This is what Moses is telling the people. And it's still part of the word of God. It didn't grow old and become obsolete. Now, in the New Jerusalem, when we are in the state of perfection, there's no temple, but, but we are not there yet. And therefore, what is becoming obsolete is not yet obsolete. Also, the writer of Hebrews tells us this. So he says, six days you will do labor, but on the seventh day it shall be for you holy, a, a sacred day of rest unto the Lord. It's acknowledging him. And then he says, all who do work in it, and I would highlight this, all who do work in it, that means on that day, it says, you must. He will be put to death. Now, also in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 13, it speaks about Yeshua. And it says that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Because I believe in the Trinity, Yeshua, he is God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit we can say that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Sabbath truth is eternal. I want to say that again. Sabbath truth, it has eternal relevance. Why is that? Because one of the ways that, that Sabbath is expressed in the new covenant is with a kingdom connection. Read Luke chapter 14. So the character of the Sabbath is the character of the kingdom. And when we look at this passage of Scripture, we see that God, who does not change, God, who is perfect, he says, those who violate the Sabbath, under the Torah law, they're put to death. We don't put people to death today because they do not keep the Shabbat. We cannot keep it. No temple. Other factors are in play here. But the relevance of Shabbat, we should learn and apply that truth in the spirit to our life. 
That's the proper understanding of this passage. Look at verse 3. He gives one Sabbath commandment. He says here, Lo tevaru esh bekol mashvotechem beyom Shabbat. Do not, and this is word for not just lighting a fire, but passing fire from one location to another. Let me illustrate this with something from rabbinical law. Rabbinically, not saying this biblically, but rabbinically, they make a distinction between Shabbat law and the law for a high Sabbath, a festival day. Now, this is significant. (coughs) Excuse me. This is significant because it teaches us something. Rabbinical Judaism sees a difference between a high Sabbath and a typical seventh-day Sabbath from an observance, what is permissible and what's not. They say on a high Sabbath, on a holiday, it is permissible to transfer fire, meaning this. If you have a pre-existent flame, you can take a match, light it with that pre-existing flame, and light something else on a festival. On Shabbat, You cannot, based upon this. But biblically, we find that Shabbat law and festival law, those high Sabbaths, there's no distinction between them. So he says, do not kindle, light, transfer fire in any of your dwelling places on the Sabbath day. Let's move to verse 4. Verse 4, we see that there's a change. Now he's going to be emphasizing in everything that we're going to talk about from now until the conclusion of our study tonight has to do with worship, things that are related for worship. And notice what we see here. Once more, how this scripture began, he's going to do something very similar. Verse 4, And Moses said to all, and it's that same word, Eda, Edat B'nai Israel, all the congregation, the witnesses, of the children of Israel, saying, This is the word which the Lord commanded, saying. Now he's getting very specific, not the varim words, but one word. It's related to worship, and one very important aspect of worship is offering. Now, we know the word korban for a sacrifice, but there's also another word, and we're going to encounter that in a moment, the word truma. Truma is an offering where a korban frequently is a blood sacrifice or a grain sacrifice. But this is going to be speaking about something, a donation that has what we could call greater monetary value. And what does he say? Speaking about this word, he says, look now to verse 5. He says, take from you. And it's in the plural. Moses instructing all the children of Israel, take from yourselves, truma ladonai, a donation unto the Lord. Realize something. Worship involves giving. Worship involves making a sacrifice, giving an offering. Can't deny that. So he says, take from yourselves a donation to the Lord. But notice, he, he specifies who he's speaking to. He addresses everyone, but the only people who can fulfill that are those, ko nadif belibo, which means everyone who is, and the word nadif means generous. Now, it's also related for the word for volunteering. And what he's saying is this, he's not addressing those when someone says, Can I have a volunteer? And no one moves. And then finally someone says, well, I guess I'll I'll, I'll volunteer. No, this is speaking about one who desires. It's his nature. He wants to volunteer. She wants to do this. Nadiv, they have a generous spirit within them. That's their their attribute, their, their character. So everyone who's generous in his heart, It says, let him bring it, bring what? This donation unto the Lord. And what type of donation? Gold, silver, 
copper or bronze, however you translate the word nechoshet. And then in verse 6, we see techelet, this is turquoise, that unique material. Argamon, royal purple, a very, very expensive purple garment. And also tolat shani, which is scarlet or crimson. And, and linen, and then finally izim, which is goats, meaning goat hair. Verse 7. Also, ram skins, and then it tells us that these ram skins need to be dyed red, and also, orot pechashim. Now, what that is, that animal that provides these skins, there's different understandings of it. I should probably say different guesses for what it is. We do not know. But... We're called to bring ram skins and this other type of animal skin and also acacia word, verse 8. And oil for illumination and spices for the anointing oil and also spices for incense, verse 9. And stones of shoham, stones for the, the settings, the settings of both the ephod the vest and the breastplate, the koshen. So these are the things that the children of Israel are supposed to offer, donate unto the Lord in regard to making worship the way that God demands to be worshiped, making it a reality. And who does he call to participate in this? Those who have a generous heart. His heart is generous. Now let's move to verse 8. 10. We're going to go very quickly tonight, verses 10 through verse 19, and we're going to really, it's a review. All these things that we're dealing with in this passage, we've encountered before and we're going to encounter again. We've encountered them several times, and what is this? The various vessels. Look now to verse 10. And everyone who has a wise heart in him. Now, this is a giftedness. There are people that have been gifted with wisdom and how to make, construct these vessels. So initially, everyone who has a generous heart, now for the construction, it those that have a wise heart among you. It says, let them come and let them make all which the Lord commanded. Now, this is the third time thus far in this 35th chapter that we've seen this. Siva le'adonai, what the Lord has commanded. And this is important because it's this commanding, this word for commanding, that's also related to unity, togetherness. And what we learn is this, it's when we unite in worship that we're going to experience togetherness with not only one another, but also with God. But here's the key. It is not a worship that originates with how I think, what makes sense to me, but it's always that which is rooted in the instructions, the commandments of God. So once more, all that have a wise heart among you, you shall come and you shall do all which the Lord commanded. And what are these things that have to be made? Well, first and foremost, we're talking about at this time, not the temple, but the Mishkan, the tabernacle. So he says, look at verse 11, the tabernacle with its tent and its covering and also its hooks and its planks, its bars and its pillars and its sockets. Now, all of these words we've encountered previously, they were mentioned earlier in how to construct it. And now this is, if I'm not mistaken, the third time that Exodus dedicates itself to speaking of these things for the purpose of making the tabernacle. So once more, look at verse 11. For the tabernacle with its tent, its covering, its hooks, its planks, its bars, its pillars, and its sockets. Verse 12. 
Now, this is speaking, verse 11 was speaking about the general structure. Now we're going to go into more precise elements. Look at verse 12. The first thing that's mentioned, the ark, the ark of the covenant. The ark and its, its poles, those were used to carry it, to transport it. The ark and its poles and the kaport. We mentioned this earlier tonight in Hebrews 4, that mercy seat, that throne of grace, the kaport, the covering that was solid gold that set upon the ark. And also the, the veil of the, the screen, this veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. So all of these things we've looked at before, now verse 13. And the table, what table? The table, as we'll see in a moment, for showbread. The table and its poles, what were used to carry it in all of its vessels. And also the, the showbread, the lechem hapanim, the showbread. Verse 14. Now we're dealing with the menorah, the golden lampstand, the menorah for illumination and its vessels, its lamps. This is what would hold the oil. So its lamps for the, the, the oil for illumination, verse 15. And also the incense offering and its poles. It also has poles for, for its transportation and the oil for the anointing, the anointing oil, and also the incense of spices, and the screen that was for the entrance, for the entrance to the tabernacle. So again, this, these vessels are being listed so that we are exactly having everything that God demands for worship. It's being repeated over and over to show an emphasis. Look now to verse 16. We're going to deal with the, the altar for incense. Or excuse me, we dealt with that, verse 16. And also the altar of the burnt offering and the, the netting of copper. We saw when we studied it that there was kind of a copper netting which was part of this, this large altar outside the tabernacle in the courtyard. So the netting of the, the copper uh, aspect for the, the altar outside, which was to it and its poles and its vessels, and also the, the basin and its stand, the kior, where the priests would wash themselves, their hands and their feet, in order to serve, verse 17. And also the curtains of the, the courtyard and its pillars and its pegs and its screen for the gate of the courtyard. So the courtyard, as you recall, has a screen that, that separates it for its entrance, for its gate. And now verse 18. And the pegs for the tabernacle, and the pegs for the courtyard and its cords. So you have the pegs that you put into the ground and the cords that you attach the screens, the curtains to. And then finally, our last verse, look at verse 19. Here we're dealing with what's also been mentioned, and this has to do with the garments. The garments for the priesthood, both the high priests and the regular priest. Let's read this verse and we'll conclude. Verse 19. And the garments of the office. That's literally what it says. It is the word, here it's the word, hashrad, which is derived from the word misrad, which is office. This is the calling, this, this role that the priest had to serve. So they had garments for their office to serve in the holy place. Their garments of holiness for Aaron, the priests, and for his sons to serve as priests to do their role. And all of this is setting the stage for the erecting of the tabernacle. 
so that people can begin to travel. And here's the last thing I'll say tonight. It is so significant that the people would, would travel with the tabernacle. And what that teaches us, and here's the principle that I want to leave you with, and that's this. In order to go the Lord's way, it is incumbent upon that person to worship God. If you are not worshiping God, you're not going to be in His will. You cannot go the journey beyond His way that He wants you to travel upon. So worship is foundational. Well, I'll close with that. May you have a meaningful Yom HaKippurim, a day of atonement, a meaningful fast as you prepare yourself, remembering the work of our great high priest, Messiah Yeshua. Until next time, Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Shalom from Israel.